pick one thing, pick the worst thing, the thing that you really need to master, and do some journaling around it. Try to understand what is going on with you emotionally that leads you to that choice. Like it's, I, think, I think habits are really complicated and they're rooted in so many things, our history, our relationships, you know, the emotional baggage that comes with them. The better that you can understand that, then you can start to see what triggers you to, to, in, to you know, embark on that behavior. Um, and then setting yourself up for success by setting a goal, being public about it, surrounding yourself with people that will encourage your success and also people that will hold you accountable to what you say. Like if you say, you know, I'm going to run a 10K or I'm going to lose 10 pounds or I'm going to quit, whatever, you know, I'm going to stop gambling or whatever it is, that people know what's going on. So you, you feel that pressure, I think, is helpful as well. Um, so a day in food for me would be starting the morning with a, with a uh, smoothie of dark leafy greens and lots of superfoods and berries and nuts and seeds, uh, any variety of that. Then I'll train then, and post-workout, I would do another smoothie, maybe with some plant-based protein in it. Uh, snacks are, are simple, like dates, bananas, um, almonds, nut butters, things like that. Uh, lunch is usually pretty light, like a big salad or some, some veggies or lentils with rice, things like that. Uh, and then dinner, I usually eat a little bit more. Veggie burritos, anything from our cookbook that Julie prepares. Uh, when I'm training a lot, it tends to be the, f the more filling recipes like potato salad and vegan lasagna and enchiladas and things like that. We eat a lot of Mexican food in our diet. Yeah, and I'll just add, so make sure that you're getting a recovery blend in at least within 30 minutes that you finish your workout. And then eating enough quantity, okay, when he was training like a lot of hours, make sure that you're really getting, you know, a good healthy quantity of food because it's going to fuel you the following day. Um, and the other thing that I would say is let's make sure that we're eating a lot of variety that is, uh, you know, local, in, in wherever you're living. So I think some of us get in the habit of like, you know, we say, oh, well, I like black beans. And then you just get in the habit, you always eat black beans. Vary what you're eating. So a lot of variety, a lot of quantity, and uh, getting that recovery blend in. We have a section in the back of the cookbook that's, um, it has a, a listed, a day in the life, and specific recipes. It's called transformation, or performance, actually, would be for athletes, in the back of the Plant Power Way. Do you take supplements, and what does that look like, in addition to all the plant-based foods? Yeah, sure. So the question is supplements. Um, I've been on my own journey with supplements. When I first began eating plant-based, and I was training crazy hours, I was really worried about making sure that I was meeting all my nutritional needs, and that I wasn't gonna be vitamin or nutrient deficient in any way. And so my cabinet proliferated with all kinds of, you know, plastic containers of all kinds of stuff, you know, and my smoothies had, you know, more powder in it than real food. Um, and after doing that for a couple of years, I started to think, well, like, is any of this doing anything? Like, is this really working or am I being duped? And, and I've done experiments where I kind of weaned myself off of everything and I've journaled and paid attention to you know, how I'm performing. And I found that for the most part, I, I really don't take supplements anymore. I will supplement with some plant-based protein occasionally. It's not a daily thing. I don't do it every single day. It's not like every morning I do it. <clears throat> I do take vitamin B12. Uh, I think whether you're vegan on a plant-based diet or even most people are B12 deficient, uh, it's easy to find out what your deficiencies are. Um, I think a lot of people in, you know, we live in California, so I don't have to worry so much about vitamin D, but a lot of people are vitamin D deficient. But beyond that, like, I really don't supplement with anything else anymore. This woman here, yeah. Julie, what's your best advice for picky, resistant kids and husbands? <laughs> Okay, so the question was, what was my best advice for uh, resistance in the kitchen? Uh, picky children and spouses and husbands and family members. So uh, my tactic is um, to make sure that you have a lot of love and compassion coming from your kitchen. It's the most important ingredient. And I think sometimes as vegans or as passionate plant-based advocates, 
we kind of lose our sensibility because we end up fighting against uh, other people, which is not, that is not the way. So what I do is I make sure that I have a lot of healthy varieties of whole plant-based foods. I make sure that I uh, hone my skills as a chef and I make it as tasty as I possibly can. And when my children protest, I listen, but I do not react emotionally. Um, if they tell me they're not going to eat what I prepared, I don't rush to the kitchen and try to solve their issue for them. I listen to them and kind of say, yeah, I hear that. I hear you don't like Brussels sprouts. And I hear that, and here's six other options that are on the table right now, and I just kind of let go. Like, and th so they don't get a big resistance from me. And in my experience, you know, when we started out, we, Rich was vegan first. I was vegetarian when I healed myself because I was still using some medicated ghee and some kind of, you know, sacred milk type of stuff. Um, but when we began, our older boys, one was vegetarian, one was what we thought was clean meat, and the two little girls had never eaten meat. Um, now we are all plant-based. And it is all each individual's personal choice that we are plant-based. And I think that that brings a lasting change. And I think that we have to honor and respect where everybody is in their journey. Just because they're eating meat does not mean you should withdraw your love from them or judge them. Um, and that is what I found with Rich. It was when I stopped needing him to be on my track and I decided to just really love him with everything that I had, that's when Divine Mother or the Force could step in and that's when his transformation happened. Hi, um, I have to say, first of all, it's an honor to meet you. I'm a sports nutrition and exercise specialist. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of research and it, you're truly an inspiration. Um, but my question for you is I'm training a lot of different athletes and most of them when they get into endurance training they feel that they can't consume enough food in a day to get all their calorie intake. Mm -hmm. What is your advice for when you're really in the middle of high-end training? Uh, what high calorie foods do you consume? Right, so all right. So when I'm training a lot of high calorie foods that I consume, um, a lot of potatoes, you know, I think when I'm training, even when I'm training, I'm trying to take in 100 to 200 calories an hour at a minimum. Um, and a lot of my training is in the aerobic kind of zone two, which is kind of your fat burning zone. So as you become more adept at that, you become more efficient in that, in that, in that movement. Um, my appetite has gone down and my caloric needs have gone down because what used to be, you know, like a distance that used to be quite taxing is no longer that taxing on my body. So it doesn't require the, the, the caloric demands that it once did. But I think when you have athletes that are trying to get to that place, um, I think, you know, a healthy source of clean burning carbohydrates, like lots of sweet potatoes. And, you know, there's all this weird stuff now about like how fruit isn't good for you, but like I eat tons of fruit, you know, and I've tried to, you know, focus my training foods on whole foods. So like if I'm out on the bike, it's dates and bananas, and like I said before, almond butters and sweet potato and things like that. Not the Gatorades and the goos and the gels and all that kind of crazy, high sugar, artificially flavored and, and sweetened stuff. Does that answer the question? You know, lentils, rice, like the basic stuff, you know. Um, so a lot of the vegans in the room, some of us are lanky, some of us aren't. You know, those that are trying to build muscle, um, what are some of, you know, five or so uh, foods you recommend for those that are trying to build muscle on a weightlift regimen and they're just starting from, from nowhere? Right, right. Well, I think that, that, I mean, I'm not an expert in that, in that area, um, you know, but Robert Cheek's got a couple books about that and v there's a website called veganbodybuilding.com, veganbodybuilder.com. Um, plenty of resources online about that. Robert just came out with a book recently that talks all about that kind of stuff. I think it's more about, I think, I think building the muscle, it's more about, it's not about like amping up your protein to some insane level, it's just more calories and then what kind of training are you doing? Are you doing heavy weight, low rep? Are you doing you know, like high rep, low weight? Like a lot of how you build muscle is really more about 
the kind of training that you're doing than the, than the exercise itself. But I would, Cheek, uh, C-H-E-E-K-E, -E -E. yeah, Cheek. Can you speak a little bit more about your journey of healing yourself? Yeah, so the question was if I could speak a little bit more about how I healed myself of a cyst in the front of my neck. And um, it was, uh, I had been practicing yoga for some time and I definitely had a, a connection with the lineage and I felt very, uh, very soothed and very connected by those practices. And I was always a thin person, so I was never struggling with my weight and I sort of ate whatever I wanted to eat without really much thought. And uh, then I developed very suddenly this large golf ball sized cyst in my neck and it really got my attention and I felt like it was an opportunity for me to explore uh, food I as medicine. Um, and really when you think about it, how else would I ever have gotten that connection to food in the body that I chose and, and how I was li living. So. Um, the doctors wanted to cut cut it out. I had had a tonsillectomy as an adult. And the surgeon was very kind of nonchalant. It was like, oh, we'll just take your tonsils out and it'll just be a week and it'll be no big deal. And I, I went along with it really because I was in that paradigm that the doctor knows and when the doctor tells you something, then you need to do it. So um, something went wrong in the surgery and I had massive referred pain from my uh, throat to my eardrums. And it was so intense that morphine wasn't working. So uh, I, I ended up you know, emerging from that experience uh, all healed and whole, but I was not really excited about somebody cutting my neck again. So uh, even though all the doctors wanted to operate, you know, probably if they had been able to puncture it, I might have gone for it, but it was a, it was a medium level surgery. And against everybody's advice, I decided that I was going to heal it myself. And Rich was not on board with me at all. Um, and neither was any of my family. But I felt very convicted and it was something that I believed deeply in. And so I sought out the help of an Ayurvedic physician who actually used herbs and a lifestyle shift. Um, and I eliminated all the stress out of my life, the unneeded stress out of my life. And I began to wake up early in the morning hours before life gets started. So I would wake up between 4.30 and 6 a.m. for my prayers, my mantra, my music, my singing. Um, and then I would begin my day. And uh, so it was predominantly a plant-based diet, uh, lots of legumes and rice and dark leafy greens and very specific fruits and plants. In, in Ayurveda, every plant has a quality or a dosha. So it was an extremely specific diet. I ate off of one sheet of notebook paper for two years. Um, and in the beginning part of my journey, it included uh, drinking these very smelly herbs. They smelled like sewage, dirt, and sulfur. And I drank them every night. And I applied a paste to my neck and wrapped it and slept every night. And after about four months, it started to go down and I knew I was gaining. Uh, and it took me about a year and a half complete, but I completely healed it. And the, I had three surgeons tell me unequivocally it was not possible. So are you ever finding difficulty with joint pain with all the running you do? Because I find that's something I am finding to be an impediment. And if so, how do you deal with it nutritionally or otherwise? Yeah, so the question is, do I have joint pain? I mean, I would say, you know, I'm almost 49, so I, it's a little bit, I'm a little bit ricketier than I used to be when I get up in the morning, and that's when I notice if anything's not quite right. Um, so I'll have, you know, when I'm running a lot, like, yeah, I'll, I'll feel little stuff here and there. I wouldn't, I, I can't say that I've ever really had joint pain. Um, and I'm not sure if that's because of the way that I'm training or the way my body is just wired. But I think that I can say and will say that one of the things that's great about eating plant-based is, is that when you're eating a plant-based diet, it's predominantly very anti-inflammatory, right? And so whether you're experiencing joint pain or you have a chronic illness, so many of these diseases that we're suffering from now, including injuries caused by overuse and training, are related to inflammation. And to the extent that we can impact that by 
making choices about the foods that we eat, that's a very powerful thing, right? So when not all, not all plant-based foods are anti-inflammatory, but by and large and on the whole they are. So when you're eating plant-based, you're in a very anti-inflammatory state, which basically helps your body's immune system function at its peak, which allows your body to repair itself more efficaciously and more expeditiously in between workouts, right? Because as an athlete, whether you're a runner or whatever you do, you don't get faster or stronger during your workout. It's that period of time in between in your training sessions when your body is repairing itself, right? And the, and, the, and the better that you can repair yourself and the more quickly you can repair yourself in between those training sessions, then, then the faster you're gonna get, the harder you can train, and the less likely you are to get injured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so to the extent that the foods you're eating can impact that window of opportunity, that's a very cool thing, right? So I think one of the reasons that I've been able to remain essentially injury-free is because of the foods that I'm eating.